didn't want to keep it where I put it. I'm not used to that. Um, they have a bag, and you take that bag when you go to a ball game. And uh, somewhere it got lost in the shuffle. It didn't get lost. It was where it was. Terry made an extra trip to get it, so I know she paid the price. But uh, my thought is, though, you know, there's, you need to organize this thing because you know that two-year-old's going to do certain things if you don't have your game together. And I just think it's worth the detail of knowing what to have, where to have it, when to have it. Because at halftime, I said, I'm going. I'm going to the truck. Me and the two-year-old, we've had it. We're, we're done. And uh, anyway, we took two of them back with us, and we're glad they're here. Uh, the two-year-old couldn't make it. He's got other plans. But uh, the other two, uh, they're here, and we're glad they're going to be here this week. I'll be off most of this week because of that, though. Uh, Grant is on vacation. Ryan's on vacation for this weekend as well, so that's why I'm here. And, um, our text is Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. We'll look at verse 1 and 2. We looked at the, some of this last week, but I just want to get to the context of uh, this passage that we'll be looking at. And it says in verse 1, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. So what you have is... Uh, Jesus is teaching, he's preaching, he's healing, he's doing all these things, and these people with real needs are, are coming to him. And it, it bothered the church people that the down and outs of society were being accepted by Jesus. It bothered the religious crowd that people that um, had made a lot of bad choices were, were being accepted by him. And, and if you look at other places in scripture you see where he would eat with them when invited he would sit down and have a meal with them and that implies more than just going to McDonald's that means that you know when you had when you went into someone's home you were connecting in a relationship a friendship a, more than just an acquaintance and so to have someone in your home means you accept them and they accept you and so it bothered this religious crowd that he's he's spending this time with these people and whatever these people looked like, it might have been the bad decisions. It might have been bad decisions their parents had made. It may have been where they worked or what they did or didn't do or where they came from. We don't know the details of why they were where they were. But it bothered these, uh, this religious crowd. So Jesus told this to these parables. And first talks about the, the sheep. And so sheep is kind of three different kinds of being lost. First, the lost sheep. Uh, you know, sheep, they, they're not like donkeys or they're not like angry animals. They just are eating, you know? And they're eating here and they just keep eating and they might leave the, the fenced in or the walled in area. They may they go, they go what, far away. And when they're finally full, they look up and say, where's everybody? Because they're just hungry, just feeding themselves. They wander away from, from where they need to be. That's one kind of sin. That's one kind of being lost. And then he talks about the lost coin. Well, you know, coins don't lose themselves. And that sounds like a dad talking, doesn't it? Coins don't lose themselves. Uh, but these coins were attached to like a headband that was given to a Jewish bride when she got married by her husband. Instead of a wedding ring, it was kind of the symbol of now you're married. Now you're in this relationship. So these 10 silver coins that were, you know, it's a ornament thing. You didn't wear them every day. You wore them on that wedding and you put them up. But they were a part of the whole. And so nine were there, but one was missing. And, you know, it, it became detached somehow. Things happen. You know, it, it, it got loose. And sometimes we kind of get loose from what we have been taught and where we have grown up in our faith and, and what we believe. We, we make decisions. We get in the wrong crowd. We, uh, we just start chasing after things that maybe we know we shouldn't be chasing after. And all of a sudden you look up and we're not connected to God. We're, we're, we're away from God. We're away from Him. We're away from His Word. We're away from living the way we're supposed to live. And then there's the third one, and that's the, the son, the problem son. That's, that's, not, that's not one of just kind of getting disconnected, and that's not one of just kind of wandering. 
That's like full out rebellion. He was raised this way. He says, give me my money. I'm leaving. I'm going to go live my life. And out of that rebellious spirit, he went and lived his life. And righteous living, the Bible says. But whichever one, they're all three in the same place. They're all lost. And so in this passage, uh, verses 8 to 10, he says, A what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I've preached this at different times, and usually I've preached kind of all these three different kinds of lostness together. But this week, uh, two weeks ago, I guess, when I started studying, it's like God gave me another angle that, that I think is, the, is what we need to hear today. And uh, as we uh, think about how heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents, You know, we do so many things in church. I mean, we do a lot. This is a busy church. I've been in a lot of churches. This is a busy church. We do so much. And yet, how much of what we do brings joy to God in this way? I'm not saying anything that we're doing is wrong except complaining about the temperature in here. That's probably it. <laughs> But how much of what we do really brings joy to the Father? For all of heaven rejoices when one sinner repents. You know, we've seen these songs just, and I love these songs about love. You know, God, He loves us, He loves us, God loves us. And yet, as I'm singing them, I'm thinking, how many times have I sung them? Since I know what I'm preaching on today, I was kind of thinking that way, right? How many times have I sung them where I'm just singing them? I'm just saying about God's love, and it's not, it's going maybe through my head right out of my mouth. It's not going through my heart where I'm really thinking about how much God loves me, how much God loves you, how much God loves uh, not just the church people. You know, in um, Exodus 19, beginning in verse 5, uh, it says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my command, then you shall be a special treasure, treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And, and we see there how, you know, the Jews were God's chosen people. They had a covenant with him. And, and that relationship, you know, that, that was special to God. They were special to him. But he also says in that passage, he says, for all the earth is mine. We're, we're all his not just the Jews, not just those in that covenant relationship, but through Christ, we see, uh, we, see we are part of a covenant relationship with Him. And so the Jews, they, they, they were God's chosen people, they are God's chosen people, and they're His treasure, but Jesus is teaching us here that God treasures all of us. He treasures us. We're special to Him, like these coins that this, this woman had that was, that, that was a treasure. I mean, it was something special. It represented a special relationship, a special day. And, and it was something that she put away. She didn't leave out. She didn't wear all the time. It was something she kept safe. And so when, when one of the coins was missing, it, 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 it bothered her. It, 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 it got her attention. And, and that's one of the first things we see. Um, as we look at what happens when we value things, one, you recognize when your treasure is missing. She, she noticed. First time she came along, there were nine, but she noticed when one was missing. Now, I know moms are kind of like that anyway, and so is Ryan. Now, Ryan will walk in my office and he'll say, one little thing out of place. Drives me nuts, but, but I think moms are like that too. They can walk in the room, okay, who broke the lamp and tried to glue it back together? You know, they notice one little detail. But this was bigger than just a little dirty place in the house. This was some treasure that was missing. And, and she noticed it. And this was something that was a part of her heart or a part of her life. And, and uh, she couldn't go on with her day knowing that it was missing. 
you know, when you value something, you notice when it's missing. I mean, how many of us have been on a family uh, family uh, vacation, and you get back at the end, you stop at the gas station or something, use the bathroom, and everybody gets in the car, and you go four or five miles, you notice it's kind of quiet, and you're missing something, right? Anybody done that? <laughs> we've never done that. No, we've never done that. I'm just kidding. But I was a youth minister once, and... Uh, and uh, also the husband of youth minister, and we always counted when we got in the bus, right? You always count how many you had. When you stop somewhere, you count again. Now, it doesn't mean you care to find, you know, they're there. You might be one short, that's close enough, you keep going. But you count to make sure the parents know that you're keeping a record. Now, you notice when things are missing that, are, that, are, that you treasure. You notice, and, and what bothers you, that really tells you what you treasure. You know, when, when someone's touched your golf clubs, or you know, I don't even know what your treasures are, but but what what you know what pushes your buttons? That may be really what you treasure. That may be what you really care more about than than anything else in your life. You know, when, who put a scratch on my door? Who uh, you know, who broke this special thing? I could go down. I could share a Tesco in my life of all the things I've accidentally destroyed. I uh, didn't mean to, but there's someone's treasures. I didn't know the basketball would bounce off the, that little thing between the tile and the carpet and that way and smash two of my mom's crystal glasses, you know, the last two she had from her wedding. I didn't know that would happen. But when I saw her face, I realized that was a treasure. I better run. <laughs> um, we notice when those treasures are, are missing, when they're lost. Mark 18, I mean Matthew 18, 12 says, What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine to go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now the number that is not lost is irrelevant compared to the one that is that is lost. The one that is uh, lost is not more important than the 99. The one coin that's missing is not important than the other nine. But he has those 99. They're safe. She had those nine coins. They were okay. So the one that was missing became the most important thing at that moment. And so the Lord has us and he's already celebrated us that are believers. But those that are lost, he's going to find. He's going to do everything he can to find. And that's what I love about the second part is you recover lost treasure at all costs. When you have something that you treasure and it's missing, you do everything you can to find it. We have a table that's been missing from our church for a month. So this is by also the form of announcement. If you move the table off this stage, it is somebody's treasure. I have received many countless emails and texts about this table. I have looked, if you've ever been back there, God be with you. I've looked all the way around the back of there, under everything, above everything. I've been through every room, under things, over things, and I cannot find the table. So at the end of the service, if you moved it, there'll be time at the altar for you. <laughs> but no, seriously, it's someone's treasure. I got an email last night at 11 o'clock about the table. <laughs> and, uh, and I've got a picture of Brian holding the table. I tried to convince her that he stole it, but she didn't believe it with the table. But she is, she, that person wants to find her table. <laughs> Pat, I mean, I should say her name. Um, she is going to find her table. She's wanting, she's asking for budget requests, now replace that table. <laughs> but you know, it's important to her, and it was her table. But you know, once you carry something into the church, actually belongs to the church, just for future. <laughs> um, but she's got several. I've enjoyed kind of watching some of the people in the church looking for this table, but that's what you do when it's your treasure. Now, 99% of the people in this church don't even care about that table, and you don't even want to see what it looks like, right? You don't care, that's not what you treasure. But if I got your treasure, if your boat was missing, or your gun was missing, or whatever, your great job was missing, if I took that you would care about your treasure, you would, you would get in the search, and you want everyone else to search. And that's what we see this woman, she's searching. She says she's sweeping the house. She probably swept it the day before. 
Didn't matter. She's searching for her coin. And really, she's searching for a treasure. It's more than just a coin. It says it's dark. You didn't light your, you didn't light your candle, your lamps during the day. What a waste. But these houses were dark, and so she's going to find her treasure. So she liked it. You had a limited amount of wool. You had to pay. It was expensive. She's going to light her lamp. She's going to search. She's going to clean the house again. She's making every effort to find and restore what was missing. And so this is how God feels about us. He treasures us. And he didn't just talk about it in his word. He didn't just have good intentions like we often do when we're talking about how much we love the lost or how we love someone and we're concerned about them. Y'all pray for them, and we mean that, I know. But that's sometimes where we just stop. But Romans 5 eight says, God demonstrates his love for us in this, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave his only son to find these lost that are among us. To, to reach us when we were lost. He sent his only son. Not, well, not after we became good enough or after we reformed or after we got, you know, got ourselves together. No, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how he demonstrated his love for us. You know, this uh, Matthew 18, 11 and uh, Luke 19, 10, they both have the same uh, words. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. He didn't come just to heal. He healed a lot of people. He didn't come just to teach. He taught and taught and taught. We still have his word to learn from. But he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And the Father, that was the mission. That was understood. He, he knew he would die for our sins. That was not a surprise. He came to die for our sins, to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, the context of the verse in, in, in uh, 18, I mean, in Matthew, was in reference to the children and the, the value of lost sheep. I just read that verse a few minutes ago. But the, the Luke 19 passage is uh, the story of Zacchaeus. And remember, the same thing was going on. He was, he was going to his house. Remember, I'm going to your house today. He's going to his house. To, to eat with them, to talk with them. And the, the same people, the Pharisees, had a problem with that. Why are you going to the, to the publican's house? He, he's rich, he's stolen, he's not, he doesn't do what we do, he doesn't keep the law, he's friends with the Romans, everything, everything about him was wrong. And yet you're going to his house? But he says this, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He says, I came from people like Zacchaeus. I came from people who have been rejected and isolated, who've made mistakes, who have, who have turned their back on God and God's people. I came for them. Not just you Bible thumpers. Not just you religious types. Not just you Pharisees. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Again, that's reflection of his values. He valued Zacchaeus. He valued the lost. He cares about them, even to this day. And sometimes we see them, and we just think, well, they made their choice. They made their choice. That's, that's, you know, that's what happens. Or we don't even think about them that long to even judge them. Not that it's better, but we don't give them a second thought of why they're outside and lost. We just accept it and move on. But the Father loves us. He values us. He said in John, Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Just to, to wreak havoc. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He has come for the lost that they can have abundant life. And some of us, we're not even living that. He, he wants more for us. He died on the cross for us to experience more than, than the the existence that we have today. And then John 3, 16, just like some of the songs we've been singing, we say these words, we know these words, for God's love the world, they gave his only begotten son. We, we can say them with our eyes shut, with people scream, we know that. But it says, for God, the creator of this universe, so love the world, not just the church, 
so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We must break the heart of God for there to be lost among us. When we know and yet we're so callous, our hearts are so hardened that we quit caring or asking or praying, it must break the heart because we see how much God loves each one of us. We see how much God loves the world He would give His only Son. And He has put us, the church, in a place to to be his love, to be his hands and his arms and reach out to a lost world. And yet we, we, we get so caught up in everything else the world is doing that we miss out on what he's called us to do. But he loves us and he values us. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way. He is the way for the lost to come back. And we know the way as believers we've shared that way. John 1.12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. As many, as many as will receive him, not just the ones who have shaped up. He's talking about drug dealers. He's talking about abusers of people. He's talking about ISIS, militants, people that are full of hate and anger and murder. He's saying, I love even him. And, and some of us, we can't get our mind around how could he love them? How could he love someone who's, who's that horrible? But he does. He gave his only son who loves them so much. And he knows they're acting like that because they're lost. He is the way. You know, as we as we read as we read what he says in, in uh, John 20, 21, I'm skipping around, don't worry about it. In John 20, 21, he says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So right before we've seen how the Son of Man has, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so in John 20, 21, as Jesus is about to leave this earth, he says, Just as I have been sent, I'm sending you. You that have trusted me and followed me, I'm sending you with the same command I was given to seek and to save that which is lost. <clears throat> and when we accept that mission, when we accept those orders, when we accept that plan, we've got to see, we've got to understand that there's a, there's a price to pay. And um, the first, and I have three R's of recovery. We can move to that one. There's three R's of recovery. If you're going to be involved in recovering the lost, here's what's going to happen. One, there's the risk of misunderstanding. The risk of misunderstanding. Anytime you care enough about somebody that's lost to reach out and help them, you're going to be misunderstood. You might be misunderstood by them. You might be misunderstood by your friends or their friends. It doesn't matter. Jesus was misunderstood all the time. They always questioned his motives for why he cared about that group or this group. Why would you care about those outside of, 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 of us, the Jews? Why would you care of, of, for those that are outside, those who, who practice all the laws we keep? Always misunderstood. You'll be misunderstood. Second, there's the reality of sacrifice. An effort must be made to reach the laws. This woman with the coins, she had to sweep, she had to, she had to light the can't light the lamps. She had to rearrange her whole day. She might have been planning on going to town then. She might have been planning on getting water. Things, basic needs that she had to do. But she stopped everything and she lit up the house and she swept it and cleaned it till she found the coin. She had to pay a price. There's a price to pay if you're going to be obedient to God. There's a price to pay if you're going to pray. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take giving something up to spend time with God to pray for the lost. If you're going to be a witness, you've got to humble yourself and expect people to judge you. Who does he think, who does she think she is trying to tell me about God? It's going to happen. We still need to be gracious and loving and not obnoxious, but even in that kind of spirit, you're going to be, you're going to pay a price. And it may be in that way, it may be in relationships, it may be in time, it may be in money, I don't know. But there's a sacrifice that, that's going to be involved. And then third, 
there's the reward of rejoicing. Rejoicing. The reward of rejoicing. There's nothing better. There's nothing better than being a part of bringing someone to Christ. Now, it's the greatest thing to have kids and have grandkids. I mean, that is the coolest thing. It's a great thing to, to win a state championship or a, a conference championship in some sport. It's a great thing. There's the funnest times, some of the funnest times I've ever had in my life. But that's nothing compared to just being a part and, and sharing with somebody and leading them to Christ. Because it changes not just their day or their year or their week. It changes their eternity. And also, it's about doing what God's called us to do. It's like we please the Father. We have, we have honored our Father when we have done our part in being a witness. Last thing is uh, three. You rejoice when your lost treasure is found. You rejoice. Terry's mom, she lost something. I can't remember at the hairdresser. Julianne said, well, why does she get her hair dressed all the time? She goes to the hairdresser, seems like every time we're there. And uh, she lost something, and, and it was bothering her. It was meant something. It was a treasure. It meant something to her. And so she looked and looked, and she just came home and she prayed, God, just tell me to find that. And sure enough, someone found it, turned in. And well, she, she called Terry, and she told me, she told me six times probably the same story. Because it, she's so excited. She wants to tell. And that's what you do when your treasure's found. Um, now, when it's a child, and like I, one time I, my mom couldn't find me. I was three years old. She got up in the morning, couldn't find me. And this, of course, a long time ago. Someone called the police. Uh, didn't want to call my dad. I mean, yeah, I guess he was at a place where it probably wouldn't be good to call him at work and bother about something like that. So she just kind of freaked out and panicked and scared. And she did about anything, but she couldn't find me, and I was her favorite. So um, <laughs> she just was about to lose her mind. And then dad pulls back up, and I'm happy. Because he found me in the back seat. I was hiding. I wanted to go to work with him that day. And uh, I never got to go to work with that ever after that. <laughs> but you know, my mom, she probably wanted to wear me out. She might have, I don't remember that. But she probably wanted to. But after thinking, I just wandered off. You know, she celebrated that I was okay. Uh, at that last coin, when it was found, um, it's complete back the way it's supposed to be. When someone lost is found, you can breathe that relief of what is your child? You know, when, you're, when your last child is saved, you go, praise God, until they have kids. And then it's the grandkids. You know, God just, you know, just, you want to, when it's your neighbor, and you've had a part in leading your neighbor, your coworker, your friend to Christ, you've had a part in doing what God celebrates about the lost being found. There's nothing better. John Wesley said there are a few joys that match the joy of finding the lost and bringing them to the Savior. The church has nothing to do but to save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. Now, all I'm saying is we need to pray about this. Because we can't question His Word. I mean, you can, but His Word is His Word. What we can question is how are we applying this to our life? Or a key question is, am I spending my life, my time, my resources on doing what he really wants us to do or the things I kind of want to do? It may be that uh, as you think about this mission of being you know, sent to seek and to save that which was lost, have you been praying for the lost? Now, let me tell you something. When God puts someone's face or name just in your heart and bothers you kind of, that's probably him trying to lead you to pray for someone that needs him. When you see them and, and you just wonder why you see them, maybe that's what God wants you to pray about. Are you praying for someone that's lost? If you're a believer and you're not, we've got to back up right there. We're already off, we're already right off track. Our heart is in the wrong place. Are you praying? And secondly, are you praying that you'll be ready to witness, that you'll be ready to share your faith with the lost person? Are you praying that God will prepare you, give you the words to say, the time to say it, and that their heart will be ready to receive? Are you willing to be a witness? There may be someone that's on your heart right now and you want to come pray at the altar. I'm going to invite you to do that. Just pray at the altar that God will touch their hearts and open their minds, that they would see their need and be ready to, to get out of that lostness by trusting Christ. 
It may be that you're ready to, to make that commitment to be a witness. And if you're ready, I want to pray with you. I wish you'd come let me pray with you as you pray about committing yourself to witness to somebody. It may be that, that you've, uh, you've sung about this and heard about this all your life and you've really not understood how much God loves you. And, and you know today you're ready to respond to his love, not to rules or religion, but to his love. I invite you to come and receive Christ. I'll pray with you as you do that. Maybe that you have been saved and you have received Christ, but you've not been baptized. And something's on your heart that there's something ain't good. You've been saved. It won't save you, but to be obedient to his command, I invite you to come and ask for baptism. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, as we think about how much you love us, Help us to just get a glimpse of how much and that you would give your only son because you love us that much. So Father, if we have uh, we've experienced that love, help us to, to obey you on what you've called us to do. Uh, and those who have not experienced that love, Father, I pray that you would just grab their hearts right now, that there would be nothing that could keep them from coming down this aisle to pray and receive you as their Lord and Savior. We praise you. We thank you for your love. And we hope to see and to hear heaven celebrate as one more repents and comes to know you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What do the Lord's leading you to do when you come as we sing?